Welcome to Connecticut River Conservancy's live stream. My name is Stacy Leonard and I'm the events coordinator here at CRC. We're really happy to have so many people joining us today and hope that you're staying healthy and safe during these challenging times. Live stream is our bi-weekly lunchtime presentation series that we launched this spring. We're excited to bring our work and our rivers right to you. We're here for episode, episode four, Floodplain Forest Restoration with Fritz Gerhardt, who I will introduce in a moment. If you missed any of our early episodes, you can view the recordings at ctriver.org slash live stream. And I'll share this again at the end, so no need to write that down now. A few Zoom details before we begin. Although your videos and microphones are off, we really welcome your questions and you can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The presentation will last about 30 minutes so that we have enough time to get to everybody's questions or as many as we can in, in the remaining time. If you need any technical help with your Zooming, um, we have a wizard, a leaky behind the scenes and you can actually call her at, this is our office number, 413-772-2020, extension 207. Again, we are recording this presentation for later access, and I'll explain at the end how you can see that um, in a follow-up email, too. All right, now I'd love to introduce today's presenter, Fritz Gerhardt, who you see on your screen, hopefully. Uh, Fritz is CRC's conservation scientist and a member of our new Climate Negative Committee. Prior to joining our staff, Fritz owned and operated an environmental consulting firm in northern New England and Canada. He has also worked, studied, and taught with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Harvard Forest, Dartmouth and Middlebury Colleges, University of Colorado, Oregon Institute of Marine Biology, Vermont Institute of Natural Science, and the Northwood Stewardship Center. We're so lucky to have him. Fritz and his family live in the hills overlooking Center Pond in Newark, Vermont, up in the Northeast Kingdom, it's practically a stone's throw from the Canadian border. Now I'd like to turn it over to Fritz to lead us on a walk through a floodplain forest. Please take it away, Fritz. Okay, thank you, Stacy, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to share with you some information about flood Plain Forest and about the work that the Connecticut River Conservancy is doing to protect and restore those forests. Um, Connecticut River watershed is a big watershed and we have a lot of ground to cover so I'm going to jump right into my presentation. Um, the first thing I want to do is just provide a quick overview. Uh, next slide please Aliki. Um, a quick overview or outline of the presentation. Um, First, I would talk briefly about what are floodplain forests, uh, then why floodplain forests are special, uh, threats to those forests, and then a couple different approaches to restoring floodplain forests, what I'm calling the traditional approach, and then an experimental approach that we've been trying the last few years. Uh, and finally, end up with an overview of what might make an ideal floodplain restoration landscape, and then just list a, a few a floodplain forest that you might be able to visit in your own neighborhoods within the, the watershed. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the first question that comes up is, well, what are floodplain forests? Um, I've provided a fairly long um, definition here uh, provided by the Michigan Agency of Natural Resources. A floodplain forest is a bottomland deciduous or deciduous conifer forest community occupying low-lying areas adjacent to lakes or streams and rivers of third order or greater and subject to periodic over-the-bank flooding and cycles of erosion and deposition. It's kind of a long-winded definition, but I do think it encapsulates all the important elements. I, I also provided a much shorter definition, which is just seasonally flooded forest along lakes, rivers, and streams. If you look at the two photos on the, the bottom of the slide there, um, these give an illustration of, of the dynamics of floodplain forests. Um, they do flood every year. Some areas will flood multiple times every year. Other areas, may not every year, but every two or three year, years. Um, and that flooding has huge impacts on the 
the composition and the structure of the forest. If you look at the photo on the right, um, I think it's actually a photo of the same forest. Uh, after the flooding, you can see there's a lot of sediment on the plants on the forest floor. Um, that sediment is really important to making the rich productive soils that are characteristic of these forests. Um, so the key elements are, are really the flooding, the deposition, and sometimes the erosion caused by the, the floodwaters. Uh, next slide, please. So why are floodplain forests special? Uh, there's lots of reasons that floodplain forests and other floodplain habitats as well, but especially floodplain forests provide important ecological and societal benefits. Uh, they store carbon in the wood and the trees. Uh, this carbon storage can help mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, the forests themselves moderate air temperatures, <coughs> reduce wind velocities, provide shade, and cool the water in the rivers and streams. They also improve air quality by producing oxygen through photosynthesis and trapping dust and pollen and other air pollutants. They are very important as a means to attenuating flooding by storing the flood water. So when, when you have the floods in the spring or, or during the, the year, the water will spread out across the flood plain and uh, the velocity of the water is slowed by the many trees in the flood plain and, and also the soils will absorb a lot of that water. So it helps reduce the impacts of flooding. Uh, the forest also improve water quality, um, partly by preventing soil erosion and surface runoff, but they also trap the sediments and store the nutrients that are in the flood water um, so that they don't flow downstream and, and in our case, ultimately into Long Island Sound. Um, the roots of the trees are important for reducing river bank erosion and consequently the stream channel migration, which is the movement of the river stream channel across the flood plain. Um, and they are, they are also an important source of woody debris and organic detritus. Uh, the woody debris, you know, the trees age, they die, they fall into the river stream. This provide habitat for fish and other aquatic organisms. The leaves and, and other bits of wood fall into the stream and that's the, the basis of the food chain in, um, in these river systems. Uh, their decomposers will break that down. The decomposers are eaten by larger invertebrates, which are eaten by fish, and that's ultimately the food chain within the river or stream. And the uh, floodplain forests also provide important riparian and in-stream fish and wildlife habitat. Uh, next slide, please. So there's sort of a, a general process whereby floodplain forests develop. Um, over time, as I mentioned, you know, stream and river channels do migrate across the floodplain. That is, they, they erode one river bank, they deposit sediment on, on the other river bank. So if you look at the top two slides there, you can see some of the sediment that has been deposited by the river. Um, seeds are, are in the case, if you look in the upper left slide, there's a, looks like a, a willow branch have been deposited on those sandbars. Um, they will take root and, and grow into shrubs and, and ultimately into trees. If you look in the upper right there, you can see a, a small area where you know, one, one branch or, or piece of wood was deposited. It collected sediment and seeds, and now there's a host of plants growing. Um, if you look down the lower right, eventually that area will become a, a very dense shrubland, mostly of dogwood and willows, which is what you can see between the water on the right and the forest on the left. And then ultimately, the trees will grow up through those, those dogwoods and willows and establish the floodplain forest that you see on the, the lower left. Next slide, please. So floodplain forest hosts a a number of unique natural communities that really are only found on, on the floodplains of small and large rivers. And uh, these natural communities also host a unique native flora and fauna, uh, that's most basically plants and animals. Um, and I've given a list here of the five floodplain forest natural communities that are found in Vermont. If you live in New Hampshire or Massachusetts or Connecticut, 
they have a similar classification system. The names are a little bit different, but um, these are the ones that we use here in Vermont. Um, and I'm gonna go through the, the top three um, in, in the next following slides, but there are, I do wanna also mention there is what is called boreal floodplain forest, which occurs in the northernmost parts of the Connecticut River Valley, um, kind of in the, like the Nolhegan Basin, along the upper Amanusik River, uh, up north of Pittsburgh along the main stem of the Connecticut River uh, has a very different suite of tree species. Uh, mostly um, you, you will find spruce and fir growing in those floodplain forests, which you do not find elsewhere farther, especially farther south. And then there is a lakeside floodplain forest which occurs very locally around some of the larger lakes, um, not necessarily in the Connecticut River watershed so much, but you know, around Lake Champlain, Lake Mepper Magog. Um, and these are just areas of floodplain forest where um, you know, the high waters in the spring will flood the forest and then over the, the growing season, they will dry out. It has a very similar vegetation type as well. Um, next slide, please. So what we're gonna do in the next three slides is go through the three most common floodplain forest communities, um, again, using the, the names given the, to them in Vermont. Um, the one that occurs the lowest on the floodplain, so on the lower terraces closest down to the water is silver maple sensitive fern floodplain forest. These forests will often flood multiple times every year, you know, certainly in the spring when the snow melts, but if we have a heavy rain, during the summer or fall, they will flood again. Um, you can see in the, in the background photo, you can see where the sediment has deposited on the, the ferns in that photo and, and still some water in the background from a, a recent flood. So lots of sediment deposition in these areas. The dominant tree is the silver maple, which you can see in the upper left photo on the slide, uh, the leaves and, and the fruits, the samaras of the silver maple. And then on the lower left is the sensitive fern, which often will cover the forest floor as seen in, in that background photo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the next, um, next highest on the floodplain, kind of as you get a little bit higher above the, the water of the river is what is called silver maple ostrich fern floodplain forest. So again, these are dominated by the silver maple trees that you see in the photo in the upper right and in the photo in the background there. But instead of having a forest floor covered in sensitive fern, instead we have a forest floor covered in ostrich fern and a, and a number of other herbaceous plants. Uh, Often you'll find the, the um, wild nettles growing there, which you, if you're walking through there in shorts, you wanna be wary of, because they, they do sting, like the stinging nettle. Uh, but really beautiful forest. Uh, this is sort of your classic floodplain forest uh, that, that we, is what we think of when we talk about floodplain forest. Um, a lot of these forests have been lost due to you know development we'll talk about that in in a minute so they're they're out there but they're not super common i think in vermont they're considered an uncommon natural community type so so they're there but they're they're not large pervasive examples like they would have been historically next slide please I think we skipped a slide. If we could go back one slide, please. All right, and uh, the third type of floodplain forest I want to talk about is, is what is called sugar maple floodplain forest. Uh, we we had the right slide before. Um, there we go. Perfect. Um, sugar maple floodplain forest is dominated by sugar maples rather than uh, silver maples, um, but does also have the ostrich fern on the forest floor. It has a greater diversity of um, herbaceous plants and grasses. Um, as you can see in the photo in the background, you know, it's not just a solid mat of, of ostrich fern. There's, there's a lot more diversity on the forest floor. These um, 
types of forest, the sugar maple floodplain forest is, is very rare in Vermont. Um, almost all of them were cleared for agricultural and other land uses. This is a small patch that remains actually right at the edge of the village of Lindenville in, in northern Vermont. Um, for some reason, it, it was if it was cleared in the past, it was allowed to go back to forest um, and has developed into a nice floodplain forest, but, but very uncommon natural community type. I think this is the only one that I've ever really seen um, in this part of the watershed. Next slide, please. So in addition to supporting unique natural communities, there's also a host of uh, native flora and fauna that rely on floodplain forest as, uh, as their native habitat. And I've just thrown, shown pictures of six of these, the plants that are, um, that we are, um, just to show you six of the plants that are commonly found there. On the upper left, we have uh, Wiegand's wild rye. It's an uh, uncommon or rare species in Vermont, a native grass that grows at the floodplain forest. Uh, to the right of that is the great angelica or angelica. Uh, looks somewhat similar to giant hogweed and wild parsnip, which are not native species. Um, I don't believe that it has the same toxic properties that those species have, but these things can become eight or ten feet tall. So they're really impressive plants to see out in the along the rivers there. Uh, to the right of that is the Joe Pieweed, the Eupatorium purpureum, a very common uh, orb that grows on floodplains, often near the edge of the forest uh, where there's a little more sunlight. And then the upper right is the wild cucumber, which is a vine that grows up on the trees. Um, it can also it can become a very dense growth on the on the forest floor as well, very difficult to walk through. If you look down at the lower left corner of that photo, you can see the fruit of the wild cucumber. It's a very prickly, bristly fruit. Down on the, the bottom row, we have the, on the lower left is the Canada lily, a really pretty lily. Those are you know, one to two inches wide. Um, and sometimes you'll see plants that have 10 or 15 or 20 flowers at one time. Um, and when there's a whole bunch of them in bloom, it can be really pretty. In the lower right, you have the common elderberry, which is one of the common shrubs that grow in the forest, or at the edge of the floodplain forest. Uh, next slide, please. One other species um, that used to be very common in the floodplain forest was the American elm. Uh, this was a classic floodplain species. It was probably co-dominant with the silver maple, that is that it was one of the two major trees in the canopy of floodplain forest. But since 1928, it's been decimated by the Dutch elm disease, which was brought over, I think, originally from, from China um, back in the early 1900s on, on lumber. Um, and if you look on the upper right photo there, that's an example of a very healthy live American elm tree growing over near Lake Champlain in Vermont. Um, they have that classic urn shape. Uh, unfortunately, you look down in the lower left corner, you see what they, a lot of them look like now, um, much uh, you know, decimated by the disease that tree is, is looking like it's dying. Next slide, please. So there's a number of threats to floodplain forests, a lot of things that have happened along our rivers and, and in the adjacent uplands that have impacted our floodplain forest. Uh, probably the, the primary driver of those changes has been channelization and straightening of the rivers, the installation of dams along the rivers and streams, and other changes that have altered stream flows and, and sediment transport. Um, other issues are development, especially the conversion of floodplain forests to agriculture. These, the floodplain forests do grow on very productive floodplain soils, um, so that prime land for agriculture. Timber harvesting is not as big an issue these days, partly because there aren't that many floodplain forests out there, but also silver maple is not that important of a lumber tree. 
uh, the invasive species. We talked about Dutch elm disease, but there are also concerns now about the emerald ash borer, the, um, and then a lot of uh, woody invasive species as well, uh, Japanese knotweed, shrub honeysuckle, buckthorn, et cetera, et cetera. There's a, a whole host of them. Um, concerns about changes in temperature, precipitation, and stream flow caused by climate change is an ongoing and, and future concern. And it's been estimated in the northeastern United States that we've lost somewhere, you know, depending on the state, 57 to 95 percent of the floodplain forest. I think the 95 percent number was actually from New Hampshire, so from northern New England. Next slide, please. So what I've shown you here, this is an aerial photo of a section of the Connecticut River. This is the up in uh, Canaan, Vermont, Colebrook, New Hampshire, so the northern part of the Connecticut River watershed. Um, you can see the, the river flows through the center of the, the aerial photo there. That's that dark line kind of squiggling back and forth. Um, the floodplain itself basically extends from the high, uh, U.S. Route 3 on the right to Vermont Route 102 on the left there. Uh, most of that land in between there is, is floodplain, and as you can see, most of it has been converted from forest to various agricultural uses. And I have labeled, you know, there's a few remnant forests labeled in green, there's some remnant wetlands labeled in the blue color, and then the, the hay fields and the corn fields and the, the rye fields labeled in orange and red. And so you can see that almost this entire area has been converted from, from the forest and wetlands that would have been there uh, historically to other land uses. And a lot of our, our restoration efforts are really geared towards trying to restore some of these native habitats in, into these kinds of areas. And, and I'll show you some examples in the following slides. Uh, next slide, please. So we, there's two approaches that we've been using to restore floodplain fate forest, there's what I refer to as the traditional approach, which is basically you buy native trees and shrubs from a local conservation nursery. Uh, these photos are from the Intervale Conservation Nursery over in Burlington, Vermont. You plant them out in the field and you wait and watch them grow. Uh, so the nursery, they harvest the seeds, they, they start them in small pots in the greenhouse, as you can see in the photos in the left. Then they plant them out in the field as they get bigger, you know, one or two feet tall. And then we buy them when they're three, four, five feet tall. Uh, they harvest them uh, and bag them, and then they ship them to us for planting in, to, in the field. Uh, next slide, please. So during the past 10 years, the Connecticut River Conservancy and its partners have planted more than 46,000 trees in the Connecticut River watershed. Uh, this is on over 80 acres of land along 11 miles of rivers and streams. Uh, you can see in the top photo there, there's an example of a silver maple being planted up in Colebrook, New Hampshire last fall. Um, and the map on the right just shows some of the locations where we've done our restoration projects. The, the tree planting projects are the green, are located where the green stars are, and then the yellow stars show a lot of the other work that that we have done at the Connecticut River Conservancy, removing dams, uh, relicensing dams, uh, removing water chestnut, that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So, I sort of just put together here a few of the ideas. You, you don't, when we do floodplain forest restoration, we don't just go out there and haphazardly plant trees of random species out on the landscape. We're, we're really focused on planting the, the appropriate species at their appropriate sites. Um, and so first of all, the, the key thing is that we only plant native species. Uh, and here we define native as being something that occurs within 10, maybe 100 miles of the site that we're planting. Uh, we are giving some consideration to climate change. So we do plant some more southern species, a little farther north. So for example, we've started planting swamp white oak, which is only found in southern Vermont, southern New Hampshire south. We've planted that farther north in, in Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, maybe up around the White River area. Just, you know, to help, help with the climate adaptation, help the, the forest adapt to the changing climate. 
it's really important that we match the species to the appropriate habitats. So for example, in the photos on the upper right, you have the silver maple. Silver maple can grow pretty much every, anywhere. Uh, it's low down on the floodplain where it floods frequently, it's higher up. I mean, you often see silver maple growing along city streets because it's so adaptable. But the basswood right down below it is, is much more specific. We don't plant that low at those lower sites in the floodplain. We only plant it on the higher terraces where it would be found naturally. Um, and in contrast to that, for example, the, the red osier dogwood, the shrub willows, you know, they're, they're pretty adaptable, but we often will plant those right along the rivers and streams because they will grow very well in wet areas and they help hold the soil in place and stabilize the, the stream bank. Um, one other thing is we typically plant taller stems, you know, three to four feet for shrubs, four to five feet for trees to partly to outcompete the non-native grasses and other vegetation that's often growing on the sites where we're planting, but then also so that they will outgrow the herbivores, in particular the white-tailed deer, which often like to browse on, on uh, the trees and shrubs that people plant. So by planting taller ones, we hope to be able to outgrow that, that um, browsing more quickly. Um, we don't typically plant understory plants, the ferns, and joe pie weed, that kind of thing, because they will naturally re, um, re-establish themselves once there's a forest canopy and, and the uh, grasses are, are starting to wither away. And then afterwards, you know, if it's necessary, we will go in and control invasive plants. That, they can be a problem in floodplain in particular. And we also monitor and replant sites if it becomes necessary. Next slide, please. So just to you know, give you an example here, here, the photos on the left show a site that was planted in May of 2013, 2013 in Piermont, New Hampshire. Uh, it was an old hay field and corn field. Uh, we planted these trees there back in 2013. I revisited the site this past May. And you can see you know, some of the silver maples are now 20 to 25 feet tall. Uh, some of the eastern cottonwood are actually 40 feet tall at this time. Um, so they, they've done pretty well. And, and these pro types of projects, these traditional restoration projects, are generally very successful. Um, they can be expensive and labor intensive. Uh, you have to get a, a crew of folks out there. You know, we often encourage volunteers to, to help us with the planting. Um, that didn't happen this spring due to the coronavirus. Um, we also hire planting crews uh, to help plant. Um, and we estimate that you know, if, if we're gonna plant 400 trees and shrubs on one acre, it, it costs roughly $4,000 to $7,000 per acre to do that. Uh, so so it, it's, not, it's not inexpensive, but it's certainly money well spent. Um, and, and we think you know, this approach is really the best if you're doing a narrow right pairing and buffer right along the shoreline, or it's a wet or steep site, or a culturally or ecologically sensitive site, just as a, you know, you could kind of go in there and surgically plant the trees where you, where you need them, where you can cause the minimal disturbance and where they will do the best. So, so it's a great approach, very successful. We've done a, a lot of this and, and we'll continue to do so. Next slide, please. The other approach we've taken is what I'm going to call an experimental approach, but this was based on observations that we made out in the field. If you look at the photo on the left, and really the photo on the right, you can see there's a lot of, um, of silver maple trees growing in these sites. The, the picture on the left is an abandoned cornfield. The photo on the right is actually an active cornfield. You can see the tire tracks from the spring planting and also the corn plants, of course. And we noticed that. Well, if you, if, you know, out in nature, when a cornfield is an abandoned or cropland is abandoned, you often get abundant natural regeneration of tree seedlings. So if you look at the graph in the upper right, you know, we had three different land uses on the site up in northern Vermont. Um, we surveyed for the numbers of seedlings per hectare, which is basically one hectare is about 2.5 acres. And we found that, you know, very abundant numbers of seedlings, something like 80,000 seedlings per hectare on old cornfields. Hayfields, you can't see it there, but there was about 500 per hectare. 
and then the pasture there were zero so there was no natural regeneration at all on the former pasture so our we had a lot of discussions about well can we do this you know can we mimic this process and and restore floodplain forest this way next slide please so what we've done um, and this is a partnership with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. We set up an experiment to test this idea in two old, old hay fields. Uh, we divided each field into six blocks. So there's 12 blocks in total. And within each block, we had four different treatments. We had um, what we call the control, which is where we did absolutely nothing. We just let it grow. And remember, this is an old hay field, so it looks like an old hay field. Uh, we had the plow only where we mowed it and then we plowed it, but we didn't do anything else. We had the plow then herbicide. So we plowed it, we mowed it, plowed it, and then herbicide it. And then the fourth treatment was herbicide then plow. So we mowed it, then we herbicide it, then we plowed it. Um, next slide, please. So the photos on the left show the two different hay fields, the five culverts and Riendo. Um, this is how they looked before we started our experiment. And the photos on the right just show the different treatments, the, the mowing, the plowing, and the herbiciding. Um, and as I said, we, we did different protocols of those different treatments to see how they work. Next slide, please. So results. Um, I just, I'm looking at the time. I think I actually am gonna skip this slide real quickly. Let's go to the next slide, please. And so those were the data. I'm a scientist, so I like numbers and graphs, and, but they're more complicated to, to work through. So we'll do the visual results instead. So this is the four photos of an example of the four treatments. So the control, the plow only, herbicide then plow, and plow then herbicide. This was back in 2016 before the experimental treatments were applied, before we mowed and uh, plowed them. So as you can see, they look like old hayfield. There's no real difference among the, the different treatments. Next slide, please. The next slide is in 2017. This is right at the end after the treatments have been applied for the second year. And um, so you can see, you know, the control in the upper left still looks like a hay field. Plow only, um, you can see that it was plowed and the, the, the soil, but there's still grass growing in there. You can see a little bit of grass still growing in the plow only. The herbicide then plow. Looks like bare soil, perfect place for uh, silver maple seedlings to germinate, and plow plus herbicide, also the same thing. You have bare soil, which is a prime uh, spot for seedlings to germinate. Next slide, please. And again, this is right at the end of the, the treatment. In 2018, um, you can see, you know, again, the control looks like a hay field. The plow only is starting to look a lot like a hay field. Uh, and even the herbicide plus plow treatment is starting to look like a hay field, but you can see there's, there's grasses and also some, some forbs and other herbaceous vegetation. The big difference is the plow then herbicide treatment in the lower right, it, it's all forbs, herbaceous plants. There's no, hardly any grasses growing in there. And if we look at the next slide, please. You know, again, you see, you see the same thing. The, the control is still hay field. The plow only is pretty much looking a lot like a control now. It's, it's mostly grasses again. And the, the herbicide then plow, slightly less grasses, you know, um, not as much as the other two treatments. And finally, in the lower right, you see the plow then herbicide treatment, which again is still almost entirely dominated by herbaceous plants. Um, and what we found, you know, and I just went out um, a couple of weeks ago, and basically we see the same thing in 2020, if not even more so. You still see the the, er, the forbs and the plow and herbicide treatment, and you see a lot more grasses in the other treatment. Next slide, please. All 
So I'm going to show you just one data slide here. We'll, we'll just look at the top graph real quickly. Um, so this is number of seedlings per hectare in each of the four treatments over the past four years. And you can look at the control treatment on the left. Um, you know, there's basically no seedlings growing there, you know, a few hundred, but, but not really many. The plow only treatment, you know, there was a peak in uh, June 20, 2018, um, but those seedlings have largely disappeared as the grass has grown back in. The herbaceous then plow treatment, um, you know, again, we had a, a peak in 2018 after the treatments were done, and the number has dropped, but there's still some seedlings in there, you know, 8,000 or so per hectare. But uh, what I really want to show you is the plow then herbicide. So it makes a difference whether you plow first or you herbicide first. So the plow then herbicide, we had even more seedlings, you know, almost 40,000 per hectare the year after the treatments were completed. And we still have, you know, 16,000 or so, um, even, even growing uh, three years later. Um, in fact, there seems to be a second wave of seedlings coming in in those treatments this past year. So real interesting. So it makes a really big difference how you approach the, the restoration of these different fields. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a couple of take home messages. So the plow then herbicide treatment was by far the most effective. Um, one of the things we, well, a couple of things we learned, you know, the timing of the treatments relative to the growing season is really important. Um, it's better to do the treatments, the plowing, mowing, herbiciding in late summer so that you have bare soil in the following spring when the silver maples or, or seeds are maturing. Um, we also have no control over seed production and dispersal. So, you know, seed production for many floodplain species varies greatly among years. So one year silver maple will produce a lot of seeds, the next year there won't be hardly any. So the timing relative to that is, you know, is something we can't control. And then dispersal can be limited. You know, if your sites are far from an existing floodplain forest and, and the seed trees, or if the flooding occurs infrequently or the wrong time, um, the seeds may not make their way to, to the areas that you have treated this through these experiments. And so I think, you know, in, in the long run, I, there's a lot of promise in this method. There's some concerns. Um, it probably will work best in area, uh, large fields that are, that are near existing forest. Uh, next couple years, we are hoping to expand this work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and in particular, what we want to do is to try to get some control over the seed production and dispersal. You know, we can't control that, but we can collect seeds and we can disperse them. So other folks, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing what's called hydro seeding in the lower Connecticut, Colorado River Basin. Uh, hydro seeding is, you know, if you see a construction site where they spray the hillsides with the green mulch, that's a, a slurry of seed and mulch. Uh, they did this with tree seedlings in the Colorado River, and you can see after two years, you're, you know, you have uh, these are cottonwood trees; they're 20, 30 feet tall. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has tried the same thing with direct seeding um, in Minnesota, where they collect the silver maple seeds and then scatter them, dry seed them out into a field. And we're hoping to actually adopt some of these approaches to our own work here in the Connecticut River. Uh, Watershed. Next slide, please. So I'm I apologize for the delay, but there's a delay in me seeing the next slide. So I don't know exactly. So the ideal restoration landscape. So what are the characteristics of the best projects? When you, um, you know, when you're out there working on the landscape trying to restore floodplain forests, well, you know, the, the ideal project is really to have large areas, not just a narrow strip of riparian buffer. You know, we certainly do those. We certainly will continue to do those. Uh, they're really important for for the myriad of benefits for the rivers and and the floodplains. Um, but it's really great when you can have a landscape where you can restore large areas of the floodplain. So on the right, photo that I showed you, the photo I showed you 
back originally on the flow of how the land had been developed, and I've overlaid it with, in the green, you see the areas of forest that still exist. In the blue, you have lands that still exist. But in the kind of light green, those are areas that are that we are planting or that we have already restored uh, by planting trees and hopefully also adopting that more experimental approach in some of these larger uh, hay fields in particular. So, you know, this is this is kind of an ideal scenario where you can really restore a whole bunch of of areas that are contiguous or connected together and, and restore larger. Um, complex mosaics of habitats of floodplains, wetlands, and also adjacent uplands, and use a you know use a mix of approaches to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to end by you know again just talk, tell you that you know floodplain forests are are really interesting. They're really neat ecosystem or habitat to explore and, and so I really encourage you to go out and explore those that are near you. So I've listed a few examples. There's certainly many, many more out there. Um, these are just some examples that I knew about or that some of my colleagues at Connecticut River Conservancy knew about. Um, but again, just really encourage you to go out there, explore the floodplain forest, um, you know, see how they're different than the upland forest that may grow near your home. So uh, with that, I think I will end now and entertain questions. Great, thank you so much for us. It's a ton of information and um, we also have uh, an active question list. So I'm gonna just roll right into them. Um, and I may combine some that have some overlap. So one person wants to know what is the largest tree in the Connecticut River and what is the most predominant tree that we plant? I'll answer the second part first because it, it, I know the answer to that. So, so the, the most common tree we plant is in fact the silver maple um, just because it is the dominant species in most of our of the different floodplain forest natural community types. But we will often you know, we will often plant four or five, six different tree species at any one site and an equal number of shrub species. So probably the most common shrubs we plant are the, the shrub willows and the red osier dogwood. As far as the largest tree in the watershed, that's a, that's a good question. I, you, know, you know, I know of, there used to be the largest uh, silver maple in New Hampshire was actually on in that area that I just showed you the aerial photo from on the Connecticut River Drivers Wildlife Management Area, but it fell into the river last year. So that may not be the largest one in New Hampshire anymore. Um, down in Sunderland, uh, Massachusetts, right on the main, the main highway going through Sunderland is the, a very large sycamore. I don't know that it's the largest in the watershed, but it, it has historical significance. Um, there's a plaque there, uh, and it's really neat to see it growing right along the, the, the main street. So if we don't get to all your questions, um, there will be a follow-up email and a way for you to connect directly with Fritz by, um, after this. And I'll also share that we can make these slides available online too, so that you can refer to them for any of the um, details. 